So good afternoon. I'd like to welcome all of you to this Medical Center Hour. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities here at the School of Medicine. We're delighted to see all of you here this afternoon. Um, I'd also like to issue a special welcome to the family and friends of Dr. Vivian King, many of whom traveled many miles to be here for this celebratory day, and we're really delighted that um, you're here with us. Today marks the start of a new Medical Center Hour year. For 46 years now, this hour at midday in midweek has hosted some of the medical schools and the university's richest conversations on current and sometimes contentious issues of common and often urgent concern to medicine, healthcare, and society. One hallmark of Medical Center Hour is its inclusive chorus of voices and views from the health professions, academia, and the public. Your voices and views are welcome here, indeed expected, all through the coming year. This is really your forum. I'd like to offer two quick updates. From this day on, Medical Center Hour starts as we are today at 12 noon and ends at 1 p.m. And we now award nursing as well as medical education, a continuing education contact hours. The handout that you have contains instructions for physicians and nurses who wish to request continuing education credit. I'd also like to thank the School of Medicine for funding, including funds from the John F. Anderson Memorial Lectureship, uh, an endowment which was created in 1955 by medical alumnus Dr. John Anderson. His gift keeps on giving 62 years later and counting. Thanks, too, for the Medical Center Hour's many partners. We welcome Medical Grand Rounds today. And we also acknowledge Primary Care Week here at UVA, brought to you by the Medical School's Generalist Scholars Program. The Generalist Scholars Promotion of Good Health is represented by the apples that are available at the auditorium doors today. This afternoon, the University of Virginia proudly rededicates the building we're in as Penn Hall. The new name recognizes UVA medical graduate Dr. Vivian W. Pinn, class of 1967, the founding director of the Office of Research on Women's Health at the National Institutes of Health. The second African-American woman to graduate from the School of Medicine, Dr. Pinn went on to a distinguished career in pathology and in medical leadership and mentoring. One of this medical school's four colleges bears her name and students, faculty, and alumni all benefit from her continuing active participation in the life of Penn College. The actual dedication ceremony takes place later this afternoon, and a reception will happen in this building, uh, hence all the drapery outside, and flowers. But this Medical Center Hour highlights matters that Vivian Penn has long championed, personally and from her various professional platforms. We've titled the program, Assuring Fair Access for All, in order to address particularly the critical issues of fair and full access for underrepresented minorities, especially African American women, as students, practitioners, and leaders in medicine, but also as beneficiaries of healthcare. These are matters that have only become more urgent after the events in Charlottesville of August 11th and 12th. And if part of the work ahead depends on changes in our social, economic, and institutional structures, much still rests with all of us, with each of us. What can we learn individually as well as institutionally from Vivian Penn? Even as we prepare to dedicate this building, how might we dedicate ourselves, each of us, in this place, in this position, to carry forward Dr. Pinn's good work and the good work of so many others, past and future, who champion fair and full access? We're delighted to welcome three speakers today. First, on my immediate right, the Honorable Lewis Sullivan, himself a distinguished physician, the 17th Secretary of Health and Human Services for the United States, and now President Emeritus of Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta. 
Second in the center, Dr. Pin, whom we are celebrating and who is now Senior Scientist Emerita at the NIH at the Fogarty International Center there. And third, fourth year medical student, Danielle Oliver. Ms. Oliver is a generalist scholar in the class of 2018 and bound for residency and a career in obstetrics and gynecology. None of our speakers has any financial conflicts of interest uh, to disclose. Um, instead, instead, they come, they come with wisdom and full hearts on this day. And we welcome their words and their guidance. And please uh, join us in celebration. The end of the hour, we'll have your comments as well. So welcome, and we'll begin with Dr. Sullivan. Good morning to all of you on this very special day. It's a great pleasure for me to be joining with all of you in celebrating the tremendous life and contributions of our colleague and friend, Dr. Vivian Penn. The, the dedication of this building in her name is a remarkable and laudable event in the history of medical education in the United States. Our nation was founded on the principles of freedom, equality, and democracy. One of our revered founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, was also founder of the University of Virginia and the writer of the Declaration of Independence. But Thomas Jefferson was also a slave owner. His slaves of African descent toil not only on his plantation here in Virginia, but also in the construction of the facilities of this university and in its operations. The United States we know today has emerged, has developed out of such a conflicted history, a paradox of the past 241 years since our Declaration of Independence. This university, the University of Virginia, has changed significantly also during that period. And today, we celebrate one of the pioneers uh, that, who has contributed to that change. Because today, there are African American faculty, students, staff, deans, and others who are full citizens of this academic community. Well, how did, did this happen? It occurred because of our nation's ongoing commitment to the ideals articulated by our founding fathers. <coughs> ideals which have never been fully attained in our society, but over the decades and over the centuries, we have made progress in closing the gaps between our professed ideals and our daily experiences in our interactions with each other. Vivian Penn, member of the class of 67 at the University of Virginia, has been a pioneer during her professional lifetime in helping to close those gaps in medicine and in our social interactions. When she enrolled at the University of Virginia of Medicine, she was the only minority student and the only female in her class. The Supreme Court's Brown versus Board of Education decision had been issued only less than a decade before, declaring that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. Only 2% of U.S. physicians at that time were African American. The number of female physicians in our country was also minuscule. Today, things are very different because among the professional milestones achieved by Vivian Penn, there are many, but I will articulate only a few. First, she was the third female chair of the Department of Pathology of a medical school in the United States at Howard University. It was my pleasure as secretary and my opportunity to appoint her as director of the Office for Women's Health at NIH, where she worked closely 
with the first female director of NIH to establish that office, which is flourishing today because of the innovation, the energy, and the commitment of Vivian Penn. She performed her role of leadership admirably. The nation's medical education environment is now the proud home of many of Vivian Penn's accomplishments. First, the Vivian Penn Advisory Medical, Sc medical Student Co College here at UVA, as already mentioned. Secondly, at Tufts University, where she served on the faculty and was also assistant dean, there's now the Vivian W. Penn Office of Student Affairs. Third is the Vivian Penn Lectures at the National Institutes of Health. Lecture also at the Women's Health Congress, Congress here at the University of Virginia, where it was my honor to serve as the Penn Lecturer a few years ago, as well as at the National Medical Association, where she served as president of that organization. And there's also the Penn Scholars Program here at UVA, which recognizes and supports mid-level faculty in their research development. So Vivian Penn's footprint is broad, it's deep, it's significant. So today, I am pleased to join with all of you and others this afternoon in the dedication of the Medical Education Building in honor of Vivian Penn. For she has been an inspiring leader and a role model for minority young people and for women. A role model for them in their quest for careers and leadership opportunities in medicine and science. She has blazed the trail, she's shown the way, and many are inspired and will follow in her footsteps. So Vivian, we salute you, we honor you, and we thank you for your lifetime of leadership and service as a pioneer in medicine. Congratulations. Thank you so much. It's embarrassing to hear accolades coming, coming towards you. So I'm just going to graciously say thank you so much. And I know with all my relatives and cousins sitting here who've known me and since I was a child and they were children, they'll keep my head small, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> they'll keep me in check. I'm still cousin Vivian and relative to them. There's so many people to thank, but I'm going to do that later today and I'm going to express all my thanks to all of you later today because I only have less than 10 minutes where I'm supposed to give a perspective on my career, perspective on my thoughts, etc. So being a pathologist, having served as a pathologist for over 25 years, I have to use slides. So forgive me for you start my slides. <laughs> and actually, um, you will see, I remember um, that I never used to like to use photos and what could probably be considered historical archival photos, but as you get older and you have less personal research, you tend to use those old photos. You don't care how old you look, but, but it helps to cover where I don't have original research results. So let me give you some reflections. Thinking back on my career, started here at UVA in 1963, and now we're in 2017. Thinking back, and as Dr. Sullivan has pointed out, at that time there were very few women often no women, uh, often few, if any, women of color in the field of medicine or science or health careers. Those were days when, when women were excluded from many specialties that medical students today take for granted. I must, it must uh, admit that UVA was one of the first centers in the country to take a woman intern in surgery, because as I was a senior, I thought about going into surgery because I'd had this experience in transplantation surgery but none of the Boston teaching hospitals had taken a woman intern in surgery and there were very few places in the country that had actually taken them. So UVA was ahead on that. I have to give them credit for that. But we've seen some of these specialties open up over the years. And you've heard the old saying, and I think many of us felt it really was true. You had to be twice as good, you made half as much, and not only that, you were often asked if you were applying for a position 
where you plan to have kids because that could be a discrimin uh, 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 that could be a criteria that would be used about whether a program would want to take a woman in thinking that a woman wouldn't do a good job if she had to take time out to have kids. That should be over, but unfortunately in traveling to many places today, I still hear that question is being asked. I hope it doesn't it's not being asked here at UVA. And as you as you know, we look at history and there's so many women who have been the first woman to, or we hear about the first woman of color to do something, and that should be historical. But it really strikes me as interesting and maybe a little, I won't say depressing, at least we're making progress, but in how many instances we still hear about the first woman or the only woman, even today. UVA has its first woman president, Dr. Healy that Dr. Sullivan uh, pointed out was the only woman to serve as director of the NIH. And so we've had a lot of firsts and a lot of onlys over the years, but we're looking forward to the time when it's just accepted. You are a leader, whether you're a woman or whether you're a man, because we all have those opportunities. So what have I learned from my career, looking back over my career? When you get more senior, you're asked to reflect more on what your career has done. So trying to think how to do that, I actually put together cartoons, so not to insult the intelligence of the audience, but I find this a very effective way to summarize my whole career path. <laughs> and actually, if, 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 if you think about doing this for your own career, remember, keep it to one page, so you really focus on what was important in your life. And you don't dwell on the small things, you really pick up what really made a difference, what sent you in different directions in your career. And I've used this and I modify it when something else comes up. So let me quickly take you through my career path. That's what I was asked to do. So we're going to do it through this cartoon. So I was told at the age of four that I said I wanted to be a pediatrician. Maybe that was because I only knew a, a general practitioner and my own pediatrician. And my grandmother taught me how to spell pediatrician and that's what I want to do. And you can see I'm there with my dog carriage with my father up in the corner of that slide. And if you see the other, uh, the, the slide, the, the bullet saying Lynchburg, Virginia, oranges, yes, I did go to an all black high school, a segregated high school that we were very proud of, Dunbar High School in Lynchburg, Virginia, because schools were not yet integrated when I came through uh, because I finished high school in 58. I was fortunate enough to get admitted to Wellesley, and I must say I'm really pleased my Wellesley College roommate from 1958 to 62 is here, having come from Boston. And that was a great experience, all women. But my mother was developing a pain, and, and her physician, I remember going to, to the doctor with her when I was a sophomore and summer break, and he, my mother was a very gentle person, and he looked at her and said, Francina, if you did those posture exercises I told you to do, and if you wore those Oxford shoes, you wouldn't be having this pain. And he gave her a gold shot for her arthritis and sent her home in pain. And I remember that, hearing the doctor talk to my mother that way, because my mother was a very gentle person. And then a few months later, before the summer was over, my father found a knot in her hip. And it turns out she had a chondrosarcoma of her iliac bone that had been completely missed while she was being treated for poor posture. So I took, out, I took a semester off from Wellesley to take care of my mother. Lessons learned. One, I was afraid to ask Wellesley for a leave of absence because I wasn't sure. You know how we frown on people interrupting their careers. The dean there showed so much compassion. When I took care of my mother and I realized how that doctor talked to my mother, I was even more, des more determined to become a physician and to teach physicians, which many of my medical students here uh, who've gone on to be physicians rec may recall me, always teaching my students and residents to listen to your patients. Don't always think you know more than everyone else. Learn because your patients usually know their bodies perhaps better than you do with all your knowledge. And third, I was determined to do research because we really needed a cure for cancer, not dreaming I wouldn't end up in cancer research, but had a chance to do that. I returned to Wellesley, and I finished, but I had a semester to make up. Um, I returned after my mother died, and had a semester to make up, so that summer I asked for a summer position, and I was given a summer position at Mass General, and I happened to be working with a research, a, a transplant surgeon who was doing research on transplantation, and an immunopathologist, and did that ever change my life? Because as you can tell from my career, that's sort of where I went. So then I applied to medical school, and I landed here at UVA in 1963. Well, 
how did my association with UVA begin? Well, I wanted to come back from Boston and be close to home because I had no sisters or brothers. We had a close family, and with my mother having died, I wanted to be close to my father. So I wanted to come back. But I wasn't sure about getting into the UVA because, you know, the only thing I knew about UVA was having some 10 years earlier or more than that, visiting my grandfather on the segregated ward of the old hospital and to think I could go to medical school here, but I thought, why not try? And you can either blame him or give him credit. <laughs> but Dr. Moeller in the front row is the person who interviewed me. I can still remember that interview. And that was back, because I came in 1963, I guess it was the fall of 62, early 63. And obviously, especially in that day and age, there's so few of us like me in schools here the fact that he must have recommended me for admission because otherwise I don't think I would have gotten in. So we can thank him or blame him, however you want to feel. But please <laughs> don't. And then another lesson I learned was, another, and I remember Dr. Muller, you asked me, did I know how well I did on the MCAT? And I had no idea, because they didn't give back MCAT, MCAT scores, and I was scared to death I'd done poorly, and I'd never get in. You made, that's the only thing I remember from that interview, in the gray wool suit I made for myself, a homemade suit that I had that day. Anyway, I guess I'm not supposed to go into all of that, but anyway. But also, uh, another thing I remember from starting medical school here, first day I came, and remember I'd gone to Wellesley, and I showed up and I was sitting in the back of the auditorium and my class came in and if you can't see me, there I am. <laughs> and I realized I didn't see any other women or people of color. So I assumed they were just late. I was on time. And, late. <laughs> and then the dean called the roll and my gosh, I realized everybody was there. So I'm sitting in the back of the room thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Well, I figured I'd get, eventually get to meet people, but then when it came up for lunch break, I mean for, for a coffee break, the first break, the dean said, Dr. Miller, I still remember was talking to us, and he said, okay, take a coffee break, and while you're at coffee break, group yourselves into classes, or into groups of four for anatomy lab. Well, I sat in the back of that auditorium, and I felt sunk. I didn't know the guys, they knew, many of them knew each other, they were in the same fraternities, they'd gone to the same schools, there were no other women, there was nobody else of color, and I'm thinking, I'll never get a lab group, I know how important anatomy lab is, I might as well just go on down and go home, because you can't go through medical school on your own. And as I started down the steps, I can't believe I'm doing this, as much as I talk and I've talked about this, but this is quite a day for me, so forgive me. I heard somebody say, Vivian, do you want to be our lab partner? And it was Kenny Greer and Rick Moore, who has since died. But you all know Kenny because he served as, as uh, uh, an endowed chair of dermatology here at UVA. And Bruce Birch, and actually to show you, we still keep in touch. There's our picture with three of our four anatomy lab partners 54 years later at our 50th, anime, 50th class reunion. Uh, taken last April. But just think that they, they, I said sure, and little did I know, I had some of the smartest guys in the class. <laughs> so it was wonderful. Not only did I have lab partners, Kenny is crazy, it was wonderful. He was sense of humor, they looked out for me, and they were smart, and they taught me a lot. So I often use this as an example many years later of how a single gesture can really make a difference in someone's life. Just reach out to someone. Uh, Kenny has reasons for why he did it, we laugh about it, and he gets embarrassed, but I like to recognize it because it's important. But also not seeing anybody else like me when the upperclassmen came just a, about a week later after first year, I met Barbara Starks from Botsa, and there she is. She was the first African-American woman to attend this medical school and graduate, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge her because I say to her, in fact, we talked last week, we've been friends ever since, and I said, Barbara, how did you do it? Because if I hadn't had you as someone with similar experiences and similar thoughts, I don't know how I could have gotten through. And she said, I just kept my eye on what I was doing. There were indignities and other things, but she said, remember and remind them there when you go. 
the important thing is to not get distracted and keep your eye on why, why you're there. And just incidentally, Elaine Jones is here, who was the first African-American woman to graduate from UVA Law School, so I have to acknowledge her right there, too. <laughs> And I have only covered not even a half of my career, so let me talk fast and get through this quickly. <clears throat> so then, <clears throat> excuse me, finishing medical school, I remember I had this job at MGH and I came up with and was offered uh, an NIH research fellowship at Mass General in, in pathology. And incidentally, Dr. Sullivan had preceded me there because even though he's a noted hematologist and educator, he also trained in pathology at Mass General, so he had preceded me there. But another interesting thing that I learned, which is about stereotypes, my senior year in medical school, I still have to come back and finish here, on the day in that fall when I learned that I was going to have an internship there in pathology, I remember going up the steps and this pathologist, who's in that picture, I won't tell you who he is, he's still a good friend, and I think he doesn't remember saying this, but I don't forget. I'm getting up the steps, he's coming down the steps, and he says, Vivian, I hear you're going to be a resident with us this summer, uh, starting this summer. He said, but you know, you'll never be a pathology chairman because women don't become chairmen. Well, he's right, I didn't become a chairman, I became a chair in a few years. <laughs> and so I did. Let's talk about stereotypes. When you were forced to go to medical school and you still have to take your boards, are you worried about being a department chair? I wasn't. I was just worried about finishing medical school and that I didn't have to travel for internship interviews. I went to Filene's basement and bought myself a jacket. But anyway. <laughs> so I did that and I went back and I learned about techniques and training and research and wonderful experience and went with my mentor there, Dr. Marty Flax, who left to go to Tufts as uh, chief of pathology there and took me with him. And while I was there, probably based upon some of my experiences as a medical student, when there were not a lot of folks I could really confide in. Now, that's not a slap against you, Dr. Richard Lindsay, who was my chief resident in medicine, but you were my chief resident. I wouldn't come to you with personal issues back in those days. But I think because of that, I found myself spending a lot of time with students. And one day, Dr. Laura Cavazzo, some of you may remember him, he eventually became Secretary of Education, called me in and he said, Vivian, you're spending so much time with the students, you're really doing a dean's job. I think I'm going to appoint you assistant dean for student affairs. And that's how I became assistant dean for student affairs. And through that became active in the AAMC where I learned so much. Maybe these days you don't use the word politics, but probably forget where we are now, but just think of politics in terms of administration, learning how things work. And then from there I went to Howard as chair of the Department of Pathology. Um, the first woman pathology chair was actually Nancy Warner at USC, and the second was Nancy Davis in, at uh, Texas A&M, uh, and she was the only, which, which was interesting, thinking back to what that guy said to me. But then I really got involved in also the National Medical Association. Many of you may not know the NMA, uh, but the National Medical Association is, is not the AMA, but it was founded when the AMA did not allow people of color to belong. And so the NMA was founded. Now we've got an apology and we work together, but that was, but being president of the NMA, and just in case you uh, have this picture here, because that's the council of past presidents, and there are six NMA past presidents who have joined us here today. So you may recognize some of the faces on that photo. But because I was president at that time, the man, the great man here, Dr. Lewis Sullivan, <laughs> was Secretary of Health and Human Services. And he invited me to go to Geneva as part of the U.S. delegation to the World Health Organization. So I did go. How exciting to go and sit and see world leaders discussing health. And there's Dr. Sullivan. And you may recognize Tony Novello to the far right, who was the first Hispanic Surgeon General, and Jenny Albright, who won a gold medal in skating. <clears throat> And that's me, you may not recognize me, my hair was still dark then. <laughs> and in the back, there's Phil Schomburg, who at that time was the director of the Fogarty International Center at NIH. Meeting him there because of Dr. Sullivan's invitation, I was invited to, I was invited to, to go to serve on the advisory board, an appointment that Dr. Sullivan made as secretary. And then representing that board at a meeting came, ran into Dr. Healy again, who I had taught as a medical student at Harvard. 
and she was talking about this new Office of Research on Women's Health that had just been set up by Dr. Ruth Kirstein at NIH and Agnes Donahue, who is here, uh, who helped to set that office up, and, and was asked by Healy, to my surprise, to come head up this new office. I won't talk more about that because I could go on all afternoon, but that's how I spent the rest of my career, over 26 years now, focusing on women's health, women's health research. The office was really set up in addressing some of the issues of diversity, it was really established to ensure that women and people and women and minorities are included in clinical studies funded by the NIH. And why is that important? Just as diversity in general is important, because how are we going to define health disparities? How are we going to define, you know, disparities between men and women? Recognize there are clinical significance, and that can affect health practice, and it can affect access to both sex and gender and racially and culturally appropriate health care. And you know, and I'm sure, those of you in medicine, when you tell your patients you have a new treatment, patients are getting smart. They want to know, was that tested in women? Do you know it's going to work in women? Was it tested in people like me? That's what we were working on. But there's still major challenges to overcome related to the fact that I can't believe after 25 years of focusing on women's health goes beyond the reproductive system. It includes cardiac disease, includes pulmonary diseases, it goes beyond the reproductive system that now, 25 years later, I'm out with others trying to convince folks that women's health is more than just the reproductive system. It's not just contraception and abortion. And Marsha uh, Henderson, who's director of the Office of Women's Health and Food and Drug Administration, can tell you more about that from her work at the FDA. She is here, too. So I've come up with a new term in my talks, because I still do too many talks, and I call it the socio-political aspects of healthcare policies and practices, we all need to have a say and be involved. But basically, from when my mother died, wanting to go into research, well, I didn't end up in cancer research, but it did, up, it did end up eventually being able to fund cancer research and set research policy. I have an even greater respect for the importance of research, the importance of scientific documentation, and I think, especially in today, we all have a responsibility to protect and support biomedical research for health equity for everyone. And we need to learn better how to communicate science so that we can help combat the, the, the spread of what we can call maybe myths, not true scientific information. That's my speech. That's my, that's my thing. Okay. So there I am. I finished. And I actually retired six years ago. And you wouldn't know it. Somebody wanted me to have lunch with them this month. And I had two days in September that I might be able to have lunch. So I'm too old for all of this, but here I am. So, talking about women and minorities, and not just women and minorities, everyone in leadership. I often ask, because I'm often asked to speak on leadership, you have to think about why do you want to be a leader? And if you're going to be a leader, why not be a leader? And if you are, how do you get there? Well, I can't give you that lecture. There's not time. But thinking about diversity and thinking about leadership, we have to start with inspiring young folks to want to go into careers for health and medicine and science. And that means role models and that means mentoring. We have to make sure they have the academic preparation. And I see Lynn Holden, who has a wonderful program, Mentoring in Medicine, that starts with, with elementary school and takes kids through into medical school. And, but we have to focus on that academic preparation. We have to make sure there is access, access to admission, and not just to admit, but to graduate the diversity of students, to get them through. And usually some chance students can, with a little support, they can become superstars, but you have to have faith in them. Like people had faith in me, like Dr. Mola did, because I know I didn't do fantastic on that MCAT. I had been working with dogs in the dog lab, and I had deep things under my arm that had just been viced, and my arm was in a sling. I have no idea how I did that MCAT, and he must have had some empathy for me. So remember, I've had empathy for others ever since. So. <laughs> And we need to understand, I can't give you a talk on unconscious bias, but that is the big thing where we used to talk about racism, sexism. These days it's about unconscious bias. Sometimes I think it's conscious bias, but it's sometimes unintentional, sometimes intentional. But that is what we need to deal with. I like to phrase that in terms of saying we need to overcome, and I think they're historical 
and traditional stereotypical attitudes that may be overt or subtle, unconscious or intentional or not. So let me in, my last couple of slides. Some pinpoints. I did this years ago. I call them pinpoints long before I knew they'd be a pin hall, so forgive me. But do you speak up or do you hold up? Unfortunately, I'm one of those that spoke up very often. That's why when I was offered the job at NIH, I said, I don't think I should take this because I like to say what I think. Uh, but I did last. I didn't get fired. Thank you, Dr. Solomon. But <laughs> you learn how to speak up in a way that you will be heard rather than to speak up and antagonize those you're trying to influence. There's a way to do it. Uh, but have you or would you speak up to confront the need for a change for a colleague? Or have you for yourself? And if you did, how would you do it? Overcome barriers and exceed expectations. And I like to use the example, I didn't show you that slide, but that class picture, another thing for my, my first couple of weeks here, one of my classmates came up to me, one Kenny, he was a sweetheart, but one of my classmates came up to me and said, Vivian, you have no business here. You're just taking a place some man could have. Because I read ahead in my anatomy book, you know, there's always somebody got to prove they're ahead of you. And he said, I read ahead in my anatomy book that women have smaller brains than men. So you will never graduate from this medical school, and you're just taking a place some man should have. In the second year, he flunked out when he flunked his microbiology. <laughs> and I graduated four years later. So I like to use that as an example of my overcoming my barrier, my smaller brain. And I sure exceeded his expectations, didn't I? But you've got to have confidence in yourself. But the one thing I don't like is arrogance. Now, there are a few people maybe deserve to have arrogance, but you often destroy what you can accomplish if you become arrogant. And that's why I know my family and my friends are going to keep me in check. <laughs> have a mentor and be a mentor. We didn't call them mentors when I was here. They were advisors, counselors, someone you talk to. Today, I think we all appreciate the concept of mentoring. And I think we all, need, even at my stage, I have people, many of them are younger than I am, but that I consult to advise me, advisors, counselors, mentors. And I must say, Dr. Sullivan, through the years, has given me excellent advice. So I would consider him a wonderful mentor. Uh, but you can't just take, you've got to give. So you need to reach back and be a mentor. Always aim high. Aim for the skies. Reach for the skies. Because if you don't try, you'll never know if, you'll, if, you, if you can get there. And you can reach higher heights than you ever dare dream. I didn't dream that I could go to UVA to med school. I remember that segregated board when I visited my grandfather. UVA Medical Center was seen as that, you know, it's like getting to the land of Oz. It was, it was that wonderful medical center. Didn't think I would get into medical school. Obviously, my classmate didn't think I'd finish, but I did. But I never dreamed that UVA would have my name on a building or a college. So stick with it. And just think, and I see you get old, you start showing these pictures, you don't show them when you're younger. I'm the bald-headed baby in that picture. <laughs> and that's me with my mother, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother, who was a descendant of a slave, four generations, taken on the porch of my uncle's, my mother's uncle's home down in Halifax County, Virginia. And just think, if that bald-headed baby down in Halifax can end up, there I am doing an autopsy. For those with infectious disease, that was pre-universal precautions. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and they get to Geneva with Dr. Sullivan, be at NIH with Senator Mikulski and Bernadine Healy, and then to end up with what I'm really proud of at the bottom. There's a shot of the Penn College, and I love the Penn College t-shirts, and I don't make any claim. Did anybody here, did somebody come today with a Penn College t-shirt? Oh, nobody came. I guess it was a dress code, but I love it. <laughs> and who would have thought this building would be dedicated to me? Thank you very much.
Well, it's a tough act to follow, but I'm a student, so totally. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. I am so humbled and so honored to be here, especially following Dr. Sullivan on behalf of the illustrious Dr. Vivian Penn. While well, I heard Dr. Penn speak numerous times, it was not until a few weeks ago that I finally actually met her. It was after one of the countless events that she attends in honor of service, a talk she gives every year to minority undergraduate students striving to make it to medical or dental school. Although I knew Dr. Penn would be approachable, I decided to take one of my more boisterous friends and classmates with me to introduce myself. And goodness am I glad that I did, because it took her all of 30 seconds to dive deep. Dr. Penn, she asked, with all that you endured while here at UVA, how and why did you decide to ever come back? <coughs> Dr. Penn paused for a moment and then thoughtfully replied, Honey, I realized in order to affect change, I had to be here. I had to be in the room. That sentiment struck me and it stuck with me in the week since. The idea of being in the room. In T-minus two days, I will be pressing the send button my residency applications. As I consider the career challenges that lie ahead, I can't even begin to describe my fears, my trepidations. Let's just say that nervousness is an understatement. <laughs> However, as I think of Dr. Penn, I realize I can't run. She didn't. As she just, real as she just highlighted, as the only African American and the only woman in her class, she had many reasons to run, but she stayed. She was better for it, of course, but her fellow classmates were better for it too. They learned that women don't have smaller brains. <laughs> they learned that an African American woman could be in a space surrounded by white men and hold her own. Her presence in that old medical school set a precedent for change. And her commitment to returning over these years in spite of what she experienced, allows me to inhabit that space now. And so now I have the responsibility to push forward. As Dr. Penn just mentioned, minority patients are known to have better outcomes with minority, pa minority physicians. That means as an African American woman, just my presence can have meaning. When I'm a physician, I may step into a minority patient's room, and that patient may be more likely to identify with me, more likely to trust me, more likely to better her health. It can mean so much to have a mentor who personally resonates with you. When I look at Dr. Penn, I think, goodness, if she did it, I can do it too. And I hope that when our patients look at me, they think the same. And so it's important that I remain committed and show up. It's vital to my future patients that I be in the room. Over the past few weeks, Charlottesville has endured some trials and some heartaches. People, mostly outsiders, tried their hardest to fuse hate into our town. They tried to usurp and corrupt our space. However, what those individuals did not recognize is that when alumni like Dr. Penn stay, when they stay involved, when the school remains committed to increasing diversity and fostering students like me, that there is no room for their intolerance and ignorance here. While focusing on the permanence or impermanence of a statue, they fail to see that it's actually a community of hope for better that holds steadfast here. People like Dr. Penn and Dr. Sullivan are too unwavering in their dedication to increasing opportunities and trailblazing progress. That sentiment cannot be undone and will never be forced out. That is what is truly concrete. This is our space to hold. And so here we are today in this room a room, ironically enough, housed in a space formerly named after someone who actually opposed the very existence of people that looked like me, or Dr. Sullivan, or Dr. Penn. But because Dr. Penn kept coming back, and more importantly, giving back, she now gets more than a room. She gets the whole hall in her name. <laughs> So from Dr. Penn, Dr. Sullivan, and other great leaders on the field of progress, I have learned you can't let the challenge, or your fears, or your anger, or worse, other people's hate, 
keep you away. Keep showing up, keep being present. It's the only way to affect change. Thank you. Well, we're all in good hands. The future is in good hands. Uh, it's now time. Thank you all for just tremendous presentations. We have several minutes to engage those of you in the audience with your comments and questions. Um, and um, Matt Godbrecht and I will each have a mic. We'll bring the mic to you, so raise your hand. And when, I, when, you're, uh, when you have the mic, please identify yourself. <coughs> So, take it away. And boil them out, nobody's got any <laughs> They just want to go to lunch, I guess. <laughs> Look, I'll start. On behalf of the Department of Medicine, um, Matt Goffrey, one of the chief residents, I just want to say thank you. That's an incredibly inspiring story. Um, you know, we are honored to hold our grand, or hold our grand rounds in uh, Penn Hall from here forward. Um, one question that we have that comes up fairly often is, is how, do you, how do you engage and how do you recommend that we engage patients who may harbor or voice racist or misogynistic views um, towards members of their care team? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, and, and certainly, I can recall being here and having patients think, obviously, I was a dietitian, and actually, I think our class was the first class where those of well, Barbara and I, I think were the first were allowed to have white patients as white women as patients uh, at this medical center. So we saw some of the changes, and I've heard some of the concerns that some of the some of the current students have had about. So so those questions don't go away. Uh, but I think faculty need to be more supportive of students. You cannot force a, a patient to have a physician. You can offer them the opportunity. You can point out the expertise or why someone who's different from them or who the, the physician is who's coming in. But you can't really force someone to, to have a physician because that may backfire and, and, and really go negative. But I think when those instances occur, and from what I know about some of the questions that have come up here, I think it is important that members of the faculty be more supportive of the students and that students feel more comfortable coming forward to discuss it with faculty. It's a two-way street to feel that they can talk about some of these. I'm, I remember when I was here and some of the things I go through, I didn't feel comfortable talking. Maybe I talk about them with Barbara, but I'd go home and talk to my father about him and he wasn't a physician, but I knew he would understand what, what maybe others might not understand if they hadn't been through it. And I think you can really help that by encouraging you know, we're having a discussion right now about whether or not those sensitivity sessions really make a difference. And I'm not sure online sensitivity training, people go through that online and answer questions and that's about it. But having real discussions or setting up times a couple of times a year for just students and faculty to interact uh, and meeting residents and all to understand what someone might dismiss because they haven't experienced it could be very hurtful to someone else and working together. I, I think that's what you have to do. You can't make, you can't always change people's minds, but sometimes when they understand better, they may come around a bit better. And if they know that the best surgeon or the best intern is to take care of their diseases, this black guy or this Latina woman or whatever, and then they may decide maybe they'll go with who they want to talk to. Thank you. Uh, Mike, Mike Williams and, and surgery and some other stuff. Um, thank you both again. Dr. Pim, we're going to give you a parking lot next time. Just a parking space. We'll we'll parking space. Our <laughs> right, Sullivan, thank you again for coming back. Um, I, I learned yesterday that uh, the, the Dean's Office in the School of Medicine is supporting a reprise of our, our last spring's um, symposium. So don't be surprised if you get a phone call from. <laughs> From us, um, we talked in our symposium. We talked about some of the policy implications of what was going on in the election cycle, what was going on in the country in March, and now we're here. We are post 812, as I refer to it around here, and 
We're still having lots of dialogues about what it means in Charlottesville. And frankly, Charlottesville has become synonymous with white supremacy. In the news, if you haven't heard it, you heard it recently, if, you, if someone's talking about some alt-right thing, they mention Charlottesville. So my question to you now is, we have to move beyond that, obviously. We have to talk about this here and beyond. But the rhetoric that drove them to have that March or whatever they want to call it here, it still goes on in the White House, it still goes on in the halls of Congress. How do we affect change at the policy level in the current environment? You both have lived in that policy environment at the most high levels. How do we, right now, in this environment, affect policy change? Judge Sullivan, do you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot, but you've been high up than I have, and he's been, he's been very vocal, so. Right. Well, this is an instance where I say we're really running not a sprint but a marathon, meaning there are things that we may not accomplish immediately, but over time we will. First of all, we need to be sure that our elected officials are held accountable. What I mean by that is we need to get out and vote, and we need to be sure that our elected officials, whether they are the local school board, a member of Congress, etc., know what our positions are and know that when we agree or disagree with them. Because the first rule of politics is get elected. The second rule of politics is get re-elected. So, so you have a tremendous amount of power uh, as a constituent. So you need to exercise that. And uh, people in the politi political arena know that if they are not responsive to their constituents, their career is going to be very short. The second uh, thing I'd say is make sure that you articulate your position very clearly. Say what it is you want or what you expect and not really look to them uh, to provide the answer. You provide, uh, provide the answer. So that means it really is an ongoing going process because our political <coughs> system is messy, uh, it is really fragmented, etc. But we make changes haltingly, but sometimes we sprint ahead. And I look upon uh, this event here in Charlottesville, as well as episodes in Ferguson, and Staten Island, etc., around the country. These are uh, aberrations, these are setbacks. Because, see, I'm old enough to say, my wife and I were there in Washington in August of 63, from March on Washington. And a few years ago, our, we and our friends were congratulating ourselves on all of the progress we, we had made. And we certainly have made a lot of progress. The Voting Rights Act, fair housing, better economic opportunities, etc. But the episodes of the last decade have shown us that we hadn't made as much progress as we thought. So that means that the battle is still to be joined. And this is why I think with our students and uh, the generation that she represents, I'm optimistic. Uh, and so, so we have now a poisonous political and social environment. People in high office, or people in positions in the private sector uh, of prominence, are people uh, who uh, we take our cues from. When we have a president, who had the press conference that he had in Trump Tower after uh, Charlottesville, uh, he's giving permission to those people with base uh, instincts to really act those out because uh, of the fact that he was so e equivocal. So what, what that says is this. We need to have friends everywhere, but we need to be sure that we are there in the battle. We can't expect other people to do everything that we want them to do, we have to do it ourselves. And so, so the more political power you have, the more economic power you have, the more you're willing to articulate that and hold people accountable, we'll make progress. But it really is blocking and tackling. Uh, but I'm confident that uh, we are really in an aberrant period and we'll get back on track you know, over the next few years. Thank you. Dr. Penn, would you like to? Um, I was just going to add, I think I covered that, I tried to do it subtly in my slide about the future of research and diversity where I had that little pop-up that said we all must be involved 
in the socio-political aspects of health and health care. You're right. Both make known your policies, help with the policies, and don't cause the problems that then can distract from going after what we really want in terms of truth, scientific information, and integrity. So we've come to the end of an hour, um, a momentous hour on a momentous day. Um, I think if you wish to speak individually with the speakers, they may be here for a few minutes more, um, but then they've got a lot, a lot of other events coming up um, today. But I think one of the things, one of the takeaway messages here, too, is as Ms. Oliver suggested, the importance of being in the room and of speaking up. Um, and so we've all started the Medical Center Hour this year with all of you in the room. And we hope that you'll come back next week as well when Tim Cunningham from the School of Nursing and the Department of Drama will be talking with us about what matters most when there's nothing left to give. So he'll be giving us some tools for going out, for being there, for being in the room and speaking up. So thank you all again, and we are so pleased to be part of all the events honoring Dr. Ginn.